And in one of the most astonishing verses in the New Testament, Jesus himself experiences hiddenness on the cross when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This part right here doesn't make a lot of sense just in the context of the crucifixion. I mean, prior to this, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane where he is talking with God, praying to God, and God is speaking back to him about what, what he is to do. Now, of course, in the different Gospels, you've got different versions of the story with different ways that Jesus comes to terms with what he has to do. I believe this that this is the Gospel of Mark. Sorry, it's Matthew. Yeah, it's Matthew 27, 45. So it, it, this particular verse, uh, I believe, only occurs in Matthew. It, it's different in each gospel. That's right. Thank you, honey. There's the only the one gospel that has this, but also it doesn't make sense for him to say it because Jesus doesn't think that God has like abandoned him uh, necessarily uh, because God has already communicated like, yo, Jesus, I got, you need to do me a solid, okay? I'm sorry about this, but you're going to have to let the Romans play pin the Jew on the stick, okay? You're just, that's just going to have to be how it goes. And so you're going to have to drink from that particular fucking cup, okay? There's, my hands are tied in this situation. Technically, they were nailed, but whatever. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, for one thing, God is, uh, in this story of Jesus, God is not hidden. Now, as far as like God not doing something to save Jesus or God not doing something about this, this is his plan the entire time. Why, how would that make sense for God to then like throw a lightning bolt and get Jesus off of the off of the cross? Like that defeats the entire purpose of the Jesus story right there. The whole purpose of the Jesus story is to kill Jesus so that our sins could be absolved for some fucking reason. It, it just doesn't make sense for our sins to be absolved that way, but whatever. God could have easily just changed his mind about sin, but nope, that's, that's not how it works here. But anyways, so this is not an, uh, uh, an instance of divine hiddenness. This is just an instance of, of bad storytelling, in, in my opinion. None of these examples have been divine hiddenness. Um, I think he's talking about whenever we ask God for something or bad shit happens to us and God doesn't do anything about it. That's not exactly divine hiddenness. Uh, divine hiddenness is just the fact that there's no evidence whatsoever that God interacts with our reality. Now, th that goes, that that's a more general generalized, that's obviously more generalized than, you know, saying, oh, bad shit happens to me and, you know, God doesn't do anything about it. Regardless of whether or not bad things happen to you or one thing or another, the fact that there's no discernible evidence that God does exist is the divine hiddenness problem. Painting it as if, oh, when you ask for things and God doesn't do shit, he's, he's hidden from you. No, he's not. Not exactly. As far as the issue of divine hiddenness goes, that's not what we're talking about because God could be there, he's just a dick. Clearly, being a Christian doesn't exclude us from experiencing spiritual dryness. Coming to grips with the biblical nature of hiddenness is a start, but how might a Christian respond intellectually to hiddenness? So, okay, before we get into his analogy here, how might a, a Christian explain hiddenness? I, I mean, I would think that in, in my experience, Christians explain it as God isn't hidden. While God may not, you know, directly answer you in the booming voice that it does that, that he does in the Old Testament, he answers your prayers in different ways. Uh, of course, God could say no and to whatever you're praying for. It's kind of hard when you ask harder questions like, oh, why didn't God stop that priest from graping that child in the rectory? Why didn't God stop that? And that puts people in the uncomfortable position of having to explain why it's a good thing for a child to be graped by a priest or like that was somehow like God was allowing that to happen or God allowed it to happen for a good reason. John McRae recently uh, from What Do You Mean? Uh, we reviewed his video about why it's a good thing that children get cancer. And um, he basically said that if God allows it, then there's got to be a good reason for it. So you you end up having to put yourself in the uncomfortable position of justifying objectively horrible events and actions that there is no justification for that makes them good, thinking that God has a reason for this. There's a there's a reason why God didn't stop it or whatever. There's a reason why God allowed it to continue for so long. You'll get people that think that, oh, well, God did eventually stop him. Yeah, after 30 kids, God couldn't get up off his ass faster. Like it doesn't affect free will for God to pop into existence for 
for one millisecond and smack someone in the dick because that's one of the that's one of the things that uh, apologists argue with is that God doesn't want to affect free will in order to allow free will then horrible shit does happen but God doesn't want to take away free will so horrible shit happens because God loves us so much for some reason and my point is is that when those kind of horrible things happen God could easily just pop into existence prevent them from happening in some kind of way popping somebody in the dick causing somebody to swerve somewhere uh, or something like that I don't I don't know but he could pop in for a quick second and then pop out and there's no free will affected. You can think about raping that kid over there, but I'm going to pop in and smack you in the dick every time, you know, kind of situation like that's not affecting free will. They would still be using their free will in order to make those decisions. But then again, you could think, oh, well, if God's in charge of everything, if he's controlling the future, like he knows what's going to happen, uh, why does he create kids that immediately get cancer as soon as they're born or like soon after they're born? Why does God God do those things? Why does God put small children through such horrible, debilitating diseases? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Of course, apologists and Christians would be like, well, there's a good reason why that child had to suffer like that. Like, there's a good reason for it. And it's like, I think that's uh, bullshit. A good parent wants to develop their relationship with their children as much as they can. They wouldn't let their children think that they were gone, leave them in the dark about what they wanted, or refuse to comfort them in their pain, at least not if they could help it. Shouldn't we expect the same from God? If you're going to have a relationship as a parental figure, I do think that you would at least need to be there. I, I think that you would at least like you can't just leave a child alone and be like, your parents are really there, even though you can't see them. They're really there and, and just leave the child to fend for themselves uh, with with parents that just don't exist. I, I don't feel like this analogy works all that well at all, uh, because generally parents are always there. And, it, you know, if a child doesn't have a parent, then he's an orphan and while he may have parental figures or other figures that that guide them I, I think that the big difference is is that those people are there they're actually present like they're detectable like you can touch them you can you know directly talk with them we don't have that for god like that this situation is just simply not comparable. 